arterial valvar stenosis. I'm going very rapidly to try to cover both pulmonary and aortic valvar stenosis. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider the valvar stenosis relative to normal valvar anatomy. And if you cast your minds back to Monday, we discussed the anatomy of the normal arterial valves. And the key to understanding the difference between pulmonary valvar stenosis, aortic valvar stenosis, is to begin from the fact that the pulmonary valve, although an arterial valve, is not quite the same as the aortic valve. So let me build up for you the pulmonary valve. And this again is a reiteration of what we did on Monday. In the pulmonary route, we have a complete circular ventriculo arterial junction. And at that ventriculo arterial junction, the freestanding muscular subpulmonary infundibulum gives rise and gives way to the fibrocollagenous wall of the pulmonary trunk. And this is a discrete and obvious anatomic ventriculo arterial junction. The valve it, that itself then extends distally as far as the level of the sinutubular junction. And anatomically, the sinutubular junction is also an obvious ring-like constriction between the pulmonary valvar sinuses and the tubular part of the pulmonary trunk. The key to understanding normal valvar anatomy is then to appreciate that the valvar leaflets themselves are attached in semilunar fashion from their distal point at the sinutubular junction and as they extend proximally, these, sinu, these semilunar hinges cross the anatomic ventriculo arterial junction. So as a consequence of this interdigitation of valvar leaflets and ventricular support structure, we have part of the pulmonary trunk incorporated within the ventricle as the interleaflet triangles, and we have crescents of subpulmonary infundibulum incorporated at the base of each sinus of Valsalva. And then, the ring that is chosen by the echocardiographer and described as the so-called pulmonary valve annulus in reality is a virtual ring. It is a geometric configuration that is made by joining together the bases of the semilunar attachments of the valvar leaflets. So how does all that relate to valvar stenosis? Well, if we think of the way that the valve can become stenotic, the first thing that happens is that there is so-called commissural fusion. The valve can become stenotic simply because of the consequence of dysplasia of the leaflets, but we're going to concentrate on commissural fusion, and we're going to show you how that commissural fusion is also associated with what the surgeon will call tethering of the valvar mechanism at the sinutubular junction. So to understand so-called commissural fusion, we need to go back again and look down on the closed valve from its arterial aspect. And although you're seeing here an aortic valve, it would work equally well for pulmonary valve, because when we look down on them from above, there is no difference between them. And the essence of normal valvar function is that there are three zones of apposition from the peripheral attachments of the leaflets to the center of the valvar orifice, and these are tethered at the sinutubular junction, and it is the tethering at the sinutubular junction that typically is described as being the valvar commissure or commissures, but as we discussed on Monday, in reality, it is the entirety of the zone of apposition that should be considered as a uh, properly defined commissure. 
But now, when you look at a critically stenotic pulmonary valve, you can see first the relationship between critical pulmonary valve arstenosis and the imperforate valve that we were discussing just a moment ago, and you can also see the mechanism that has turned this into a stenotic valve. Because there are our three thickenings at the sinutubular junction. These have become particularly prominent and have been pinched in. And this is what is known as tethering. And then you see that the zones of apposition between the valvar leaflets have silted up and fused one to the other towards the center of the valvar orifice. And obviously, the greater the degree of this fusion of the zones of apposition, the more severe will be the extent of pulmonary valvar stenosis. And you don't need to be a rocket scientist to appreciate that just a little bit more of silting up here will change this central valvar orifice into an imperforate valvar plate. And you note that in the pulmonary valve, the fusion of the three zones of apposition is relatively symmetrical. And that gives us this centrally located pinhole meatus in the pulmonary valvar orifice. If we then spread out the pulmonary valve and we look at it en face, there you see the consequence of severe fusion of the zones of apposition between the leaflets, leaving us our central pinhole orifice as shown inferiorly in the cartoon. So the essence of severe stenosis is that the zone of closure of the valvar leaflets has moved proximally from the sinutubular junction towards the ventricular arterial junction. In other words, the malformed valve has lost a large part of its semilunar attachments, giving it a near annular attachment. And it is that near annular attachment that is responsible for critical pulmonary valve stenosis. If we now turn our attention to the aortic valve, the fundamental difference between the aortic valve and the pulmonary valve is that although the aortic valve is attached in semilunar fashion between the virtual basal ring and the sinutubular junction, only part of the leaflets of the aortic valve are attached to muscle. Postro inferiorly, there is fibrous continuity between the leaflets of the aortic valve and the leaflets of the mitral valve. So again, the valve extends from the sinutubular junction to the basal ring, but with a different anatomic structure. And there, the relationship to the subpulmonary infundibulum. So unlike the pulmonary valve, when we have critical aortic stenosis, rather than showing a dome-shaped variant, the valve is either unicuspid and unicommissural, again with loss of the semilunar hinges, and the leaflets become attached in ring-like fashion once more. And typically, the aortic root becomes hypoplastic if associated with endocardial fibroelastosis, it becomes functionally univentricular. So this is the typical arrangement we see in the aortic valve when we open the aortic root and we look down on the critically stenotic aortic valve. There is a solitary zone of apposition between the remaining valvar leaflets that has a solitary attachment at the sinutubular junction. So this normal semilunar arrangement of the valve with the leaflets attached within the sinus change again except that we have unicuspid rather than uniform stenosis with folds in the wall appearing at the sites of two of the zones of apposition but one normal triangle persisting and reaching to the sinutubular junction. And it cannot be coincidental that in our experience, this persisting triangle is always the one that is in continuity 
with the aortic leaflet of the mitral valve. At the sites of the other zones of apposition, then as with the pulmonary valve, there is markedly reduced height of the sinus and annular attachment of the valve. And we can see a similar pattern appearing in the, in the bicuspid aortic valve, but this time with only one of the zones of apposition silting up, reduction in the height of one of the interleaflet triangles, but the posterior interleaflet triangle reaching up to the level of the sinutubular junction along with this interleaflet triangle. So here we have what I like to identify as the annular paradox. We all describe arterial valves as having annuluses, but what we've shown you is that the normal aortic valve totally lacks any annular attachment, and that the more obvious becomes the annular attachment, the worse is the degree of valvar stenosis. And indeed, as we saw yesterday, the other consequence of an annular attachment of rudimentary leaflets is the so-called absent pulmonary valve syndrome. So this reinforces my belief that we should be describing the arterial valves without recourse to a non-existent valve annulus.